we need light. We need to be able to see. We need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need God to show mercy on us. And He does that through Jesus who comes and says He shines light into the darkness. Are you looking for meaning or a word from God that's relevant to your life? Are you searching for a better understanding of who God is? Well, you're in the right place. You found the Gary Talks About God podcast. This is a weekly podcast that comes to you from the pulpit of Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church in Germantown, North Carolina. The podcast is hosted by Red Bank Senior Pastor Gary Sanders. Now let's get ready to take that walk through God's Word with our pastor, teacher, and friend. Hey, he's that guy we call Gary. This morning, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 1 again this morning, continuing on as we look through the songs of Christmas. And as you turn there, this morning we're going to be looking at Zechariah's song. Zechariah, as a reminder, is married to Elizabeth, whom we saw last week is Mary's cousin. Now, interestingly enough, Mary's song in the the book of Luke occurs first. We read her song first. Zechariah's song is second. However, have you noticed that as you go through the book of Luke, that the announcement to Mary is not the first birth announcement? Did y'all ever catch that? The first, first birth announcement in the book of Luke is actually to Elizabeth. When uh, Gabriel comes and announces, strange, interestingly, not to Elizabeth, or, or to Elizabeth, but then gives you more information to Zechariah. So Elizabeth one day, uh, just like Mary, remember we saw Mary, so she was just minding her business. Uh, Zechariah was troubled, and, 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 and fear fell upon him as Gabriel came and, and spoke to him. He was just going about his daily business too. See, Zechariah was a priest, and it was his turn to be in the temple lighting the incense, and he was there, and he was lighting the incense, and all of a sudden, now, now remember, the, the temple would have been very dark. He wasn't saying, all of a, can you imagine going into a room where you think nobody's in? And you, you know what happens, and I'm sure some of you husbands have done this, right? Where the light is turned on, the wife doesn't know you're there, and they turn on the light, and all of a sudden you're there, and you scare them. You, you can imagine. Now, now magnify that. You go into a place that's dark. You're about to light in, incense, light candles, and all of a sudden there's light, and in front of you is an angel. And so the angel says to Zechariah, first saying, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And his prayer has been for a son. See, we're told that Zechariah and Elizabeth are old in age. Does that sound familiar? That Elizabeth is barren, that she does not have a son, and they've been praying for that. And so the angel, which he later identifies himself as Gabriel, says, Zechariah, you're going to have a son and you're going to call his name John, and you'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, and he will be great before the Lord, and he's going to turn the children of Israel back to God, and he will go before him in the spirit of the power and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And so Zechariah, while he's performing his duties in the temple, gets this, this incredible birth announcement. Now, I always like to do this. Try to put your, yourself in that position. Because we're told that Zechariah and Elizabeth are older in age. Zechariah is still praying, but he's not really sure that this is going to happen. Now, remember, he just went to a dark room, and all of a sudden there's an angel gives him this birth announcement. And Zechariah does what any of us would do, right? How shall I know this? It's not that I don't believe you. I mean, I can clearly see that you're an angel, but... How, how do I know that this is going to happen? How do I know what you're saying is true? By the way, in case you didn't know, Mr. Angel, I'm old. My wife is old. We're, we're advanced in years. And I love this. Gabriel basically pulls out the angel card, if you would. In Luke chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And the angel answered him. And I can imagine Gabriel just being a little bit indignant, right? I mean, he, he's an angel for crying out loud. He just showed up out of nowhere, gives you this announcement, and the first thing that you wanted to say after all this is, yeah, but how do I know you're really telling me the truth? And so Gabriel looks at him and says, I'm Gabriel. 
I stand in the presence of God. Do you think, Zechariah, I might know what's going on? And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So he says, I'm Gabriel, I'm an angel. I stand in God's presence and I bring you this news, which means the news isn't coming from him, it's coming from God. The news is sent by God. And so Zechariah just is still standing there, unable to speak. And so Gabriel says, look, you're now going to be silent and not be able to speak until all these things come to pass, until your child is born. And so for the next nine months, Zechariah is quiet. He can't talk. He can't speak. Until nine months later, one day, his wife goes into labor. She has the baby. She looks down at the baby and says, we're going to name the baby John. And everybody's going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't name the baby John. You don't have anybody in your house who is, who is named John. Why, why are you going to name this child John? It doesn't make any sense. And at that time, it says that Zechariah... In verse 63, took a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And then in verse 64 it says, And immediately his mouth was open and his tongues loosed, and he spoke blessing on God. For nine months he hasn't been able to talk, and now he speaks, and the first thing he does is start blessing God. And then we read what he spoke. Verse 68. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, For he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." This morning, as we look at Zechariah's song, Zechariah tells us that there is a purpose to what is happening, right? He says that the Lord has visited. When you visit somebody, it's typically purposeful, right? The the idea of a visit is you got up, you went somewhere, whether it's their house, whether it's shopping, whether it's for lunch, you, you went with a purpose to visit them. There was something going on, you wanted to be there. And so Zechariah draws our attention to the fact that there is a purpose behind God visiting his people. And then he gives us four reasons for that. And the first one is this. Jesus came to redeem sinners. Jesus came to redeem sinners. This is where it it all starts. He's visited and he has redeemed now, to understand the importance of that, we've got to remember what redeem means. To redeem means to buy back. Next time you go and you buy, buy a bottle of Coke, Sprite, Diet Coke, Dr. Pepper, Gary, you didn't pick my favorite one, I know, I'm sorry. Look at the bottle. Turn it around to the back, and you're going to see in Maine, it's five cents. In Michigan, it's ten cents. And what that is, is you take that bottle back. So if the Coke was a dollar... You would get to the cash register, you would pay $1.05. And then when you finished your Coke, you would take your Coke back to a place called, are you ready for this, a redemption center. And you would give them the bottle, and they would give you five cents. They're buying back the bottle for you. It's like the companies are buying it back. And that's exactly what redemption is. It, it's to buy back. And in biblical terms, Jesus has bought us back from our sin. And there's the problem. The problem is with us. The problem is with man. And the problem is that we are covered in sin. And I know if you're like me this morning, you don't like to think of yourself as a sinner. It, it's, it's not a comfortable thought. It, it makes us feel bad, but we are. 
We are all sinners. Now, sin doesn't just mean to do something bad, because we kind of use that, right? Sin, well, I did something bad, I sinned. Sin is completely different. Yes, it, it has that element of bad, but the real definition of sin is to miss the mark. Imagine you are shooting at a target. And you have a bullseye down there, and you're trying to hit that target. You want to hit that, that center bullseye. And you, you pull back your bow, and you, you got your arrow, and you let it fly, and you watch that arrow fly way over the target. All right, you pull out another arrow from your quiver. You let it fly. This time, it hits in the grass 10 feet in front. You ever notice how hard it is to find those that hit 10 feet in front of the target? You're like, I know it's right there. It's in the ground. Where, where, where is it? But you spend 10 minutes trying to find it. You shoot another one, you miss wide left. Shoot another one, miss wide right. You shoot one, you think, yeah, finally, I, I hit the target only to look and see. You're just barely hanging in. Somehow you manage to get that arrow in on the side of the target. It just kind of dangles down there at the bottom, you know. You miss the target. That, that, that's sin. No matter how hard we try, we miss the target every single time. We miss that perfect obedience to God's law. We can't do it. For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. Even on our very best days when we try to please God and have our best day ever, we still miss the mark. And it doesn't matter if we miss by an inch or by a mile. We still miss. So Zechariah starts by telling us that is why he came. He's visited so that he could come and he could redeem his people. He could redeem sinners out of the bondage and the snare of sin. And in that wording, we come face to face with the truth that we are powerless to rectify our sinful situation. So Jesus comes. And as he comes, Zechariah then draws our attention to the fact that he has come to demonstrate mercy in verse 72. Where it says, to show the mercy promised to our fathers. See, we're trapped in that sin. We can't do anything. So the question now becomes, what is God going to do? Now, I, I can't think of all the ways or everything that, that God can do. All right, I'm not God. But it seems to me God had essentially two choices. Choice number one would be do nothing and let us die in our sin. Choice number two would be to do something, to demonstrate mercy towards us so that we, we, we don't die in our sin. Those are the two choices. God decides to demonstrate mercy towards us. He chose mercy. And when you go and you look up the dictionary definition of mercy, it says, compassion or forbearance shown, especially to an offender or to one subject to one's power. Compassion or mercy shown to an offender. That's us. We're the offender. We're, we're the sinner. And God is showing us mercy mercy. We've missed the mark with our sin. We, we, we've missed it. And so God is within his power to punish us for that as a holy, righteous God. But he doesn't. He shows mercy. A very simple definition of mercy this morning, if you just want to write it down, is this. Mercy is we do not get what we deserve. Mercy is we do not get what we deserve. Now, grace is the flip side of mercy. Grace means that, that we get what we do not deserve. Okay, they, they, they go hand in hand. And here Zechariah is saying that God has showed mercy to us. Jesus has come to demonstrate mercy. But then he reminds us that his mercy is tied to his covenants. And that's really important because it tells us that this wasn't a plan that God was just caught off guard and had to do something about. This tells us that God had a plan from the very beginning. Any of you ever get caught off guard by something and, and you're left scrambling trying to put all the pieces together and you're going, well, i, I got to move this to here and move this to here. Then I can go over here and do this. And on my way back from this, I can stop here. And you're trying to put the big jigsaw puzzle together, right? You had it together, something happened, and the whole puzzle fell apart and you're trying to put it back together. That, that's not what happened. God's not scrambling around, picking up the pieces, trying to re put the puzzle, piece back, put puzzle back together. But the fact that he's drawn us to his covenants reminds us that he's had a plan. And we've read about it as we've studied through Genesis. I, I hope I've repeated, you may want to say I've harped on, 
I'll let you pick which words you want to use, over and over that God has had a plan. We saw it in Genesis 3. God had a plan. We saw it with the call of Abraham in Genesis 12. God had a plan. We saw it as he reiterates his plan to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see that God has a plan. We get over into 2 Samuel and he makes the covenant with David and we see that God has a plan. You take all this together, the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham, one will come from you whom in all the nations will be blessed. David, from you will come one who will sit on the throne forever and ever and ever. Jeremiah tells us that one day there's a covenant come where the law will be written in our hearts and he will be our God and we will be his people. God's mercy was always visible in the covenants and as Jesus comes, it's like Jesus is a walking embodiment of the mercy of the covenants. He says, this is the mercy that I'm going to demonstrate to the sinners. Because what could be more merciful than going to the cross to die on the cross for us? Because we can't save ourselves. That's the redemption. He, he's buying us back. The, the price paid for our sins was paid by another. Because he didn't miss the mark. Which is why Paul could write in Ephesians 2, 4-5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of great love with which He had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He reminds us of that. He came to demonstrate mercy. But then Jesus came to give knowledge of sin. He came, excuse me, not sin, came to give knowledge of salvation. It says that he is doing this, and you look down in verse 77, that he's come to give knowledge of salvation to his people. Now, in the immediate context, this is really about John the Baptist. John is coming to prepare a way. He's coming to prepare people for salvation, coming through uh, so that Jesus, when he is on the scene, that people will know. That's why in John 1 we read, John the Baptist is out there preaching, and he's drawing a crowd, and people are starting to say, hey, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? And he says, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not any of those. I'm the voice crying, make straight the way of the Lord. And as we continue to read, and John continues to preach, and he's baptizing, he looks up one day, and he shouts, and he sees Jesus coming, and Jesus is approaching the Jordan. And can you imagine this? You know, J John is down there in the water, he's baptizing people, there's a line, you know, of people waiting to be baptized, and, and maybe John is in, in, in mid-baptism, and he's got that person just inches above the ground, and he's about, or the water, and is about to look up, and he sees Jesus coming. And what does he shout? Behold the Lamb of God that what? Takes away the sins of the world. He looks and says, that's the one who was coming to take away our sins. That's the one who was coming to save us. He's the one that can forgive us. So that when Jesus starts his ministry and he starts to preach, his whole preach is to his whole reason for preaching is to bring knowledge of salvation to people. I mean, we see this clearly demonstrated in John chapter three. John chapter three, that, that famous story at the beginning where he goes and he meets a man by the name of Nicodemus, right? And he's talking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus is a Pharisee, he's on the council, he's supposed to be this, this real learned man. And he's explaining to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again, you've got to be born of the Spirit. You know, this, this is how you are saved, this is how, how you become my child. And Nicodemus goes, what, what are you, you, you talking about? How, how is this possible and Jesus gives him that that explanation and sometimes what we forget that is John 3 16 is is part of that explanation to Nicodemus Jesus is talking to him and he says Nicodemus this is how it all works this this is it and he's telling him and he brings him to the point of the knowledge of salvation how it's going to work for God so loved the world 
that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus, that's the way to salvation. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that God has given. And remember that word, so. We, we use it incorrectly. Right? You ever heard the, the preacher talk about for God, so, and he, he drags out the so really, really, really long, and you just think, wow, that's an intense modifier? That's not quite right. It's actually for God loved the world in this way. How, how, did, how did he demonstrate, in what way did God demonstrate that he loved the world? This is how he demonstrated it, Nicodemus, that he gave his son that if you believe in me, you won't perish. Nicodemus, that's, that's the knowledge of salvation. And he continues, Jesus does, to preach this over and over and over. He makes the way clear. He never hides it, even when he's talking to people and they don't get it. We read through in his disciples and we see over and over and over, they don't get it and we go, how could they not get it? Insert yourself. How many times have we not got what God has told us? So it brings us to John 14, right? John is, or excuse me, Jesus is talking there to his disciples and he's speaking to them and, and he's, he's telling them, this is, this is after Simon Peter comes and asks the question, where are you going? One of those straightforward questions, where are you going? Well, I'm going up to Nazareth and I'm going to stay there for a couple of days and then I'm going to take a few days off and, uh, you know, on the coast there, Galilee Sea. I'll, you can find me there for about three or four days. Then I got a preaching engagement, you know, down on the bottom in Jerusalem. I, that's probably what Simon is thinking. Jesus starts to talk and he starts to speak, you know, where I'm going, you can't, you can't follow me. And Peter, right, Peter, we followed you this far. We've gotten over the mountains. We think we can follow you some more. So, so where are you going? And then Jesus says, hey, will you lay down your life for me? Yeah, absolutely. I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus keeps talking. He says, look, look, don't, don't be troubled. Uh, apparently he can see that there's some angst on his disciples' faces. And he says, look, don't, don't be troubled. I'm, I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I go, you know, if I go, I will come again to take you with me so that where I am, you may be. And at that time, Thomas asked, again, a very simple question, very similar to what Peter said. It says, Lord, um, we, we don't know the way. You didn't tell Peter where you were going. And since you haven't told Peter where you are going, we don't know the way. You may be heading south, and we may decide to go north. We don't know the way. Just Could you just tell us the way, and we will follow you? And I'm sure that Thomas, at that point, was expecting turn-by-turn -turn instructions like you get on Google Maps. Right? You, you know, you follow the maps. Go 100 yards, turn left. Go 3.7 miles, turn right. Come to a fork in the road, stay left. That's what Thomas is expecting. Well, I'm going to take the Jerusalem path all the way down, and then I'm going to branch out to the Bethany Road, and that's where I'm going. And Jesus looks at him and says, Thomas, the path is not an actual path. It's, it's not a road. It's not a route. The path is a person. And he looks at Thomas, and he says in verse 6, he says, Thomas, I am the way. I, I, I am the way, Thomas. I am the path. What way is he? What path is Jesus? And he goes on and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he tells Thomas, I am the way to the Father. Salvation is through me. Because Thomas, what you really need to know, is not how to get to where we're going to sleep tomorrow night. What you need to know is how to get to the Father. And the only way you get to the Father, Thomas, is if you come through me because I am the way. But then finally, Zechariah ties it all together by telling us that Jesus came to give light to the world. He comes to give light to the world. Verse 79, and we read the Isaiah 9 passage this morning as well. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And this really ties it all together. Right? 
We all know what darkness is. We all know what it feels like in the morning to see that sun come up and, and, and drive the darkness away. And you go from that cool of the night possibly to the, the warmth and the security of, of, of the light and, and, and you, everything becomes clearer in the light. You, do, you, can, you, you can do things in the light. You can work outside in the light. You can, you can read in the light. Everything becomes so much more clear and understandable in the light. It says that Jesus came to give us light because we sit in darkness and we can't see. And it's not a physical darkness, but it is a spiritual darkness taking us back to our sin problem. Because that's the core of our problem. Every ill in the world is traced back to our sin nature. Every single one. But we sit in the darkness. And in the darkness, you don't know where the way out is. You can't get out. You can't find the door. And so there you sit in the darkness with the shadow of death lingering over you until the day that the shadow becomes a reality and you're, just, you're sitting there in the dark. We need light. We need to be able to see. We need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need God to show mercy on us. And He does that through Jesus who comes and says He shines light into the darkness. And when he does, now the path becomes clear. Our feet are guided to the way of peace, and we discover, just like Thomas, that the way is a person. It is Jesus who said in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so Jesus is calling people out of the darkness, calling us to himself, offering the salvation that he offers because he knows that we can't do it ourselves and if left to ourselves, we're going to sit in the darkness for all eternity. And into that he comes and he shines the brightness of light into it and says, I am the way. Can you imagine that? I mean, the, 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 the imagery is beautiful. You're sitting in there in complete darkness. You can't go anywhere. You're, you're, you're chained to sin. You, you, you are enslaved to it. You can't move. And all of a sudden, a, a, just a ray of sun comes in there and illuminates. And all of a sudden, in that moment, it becomes clear. It's, I see how to get out. I see how to escape my bondage. I see how to leave the darkness. And how do you leave it? You leave it by following the light who leads you to Jesus Christ. Who says, I am the light of the world and I am bringing you out of darkness so that through me you can be with me and you can be with the Father. And as we read Zechariah's song this morning, he draws us back to that point that Jesus came for a reason. It wasn't accidental. It was a purposeful visit so that he could call us out of the darkness into the light, so that by demonstrating his mercy towards us, we could be saved and we could be redeemed. And that's a good thing to celebrate this Christmas. You've been listening to the Gary Talks About God podcast. Are you looking for a church? Well, Red Bank Missionary Baptist Church is a community of believers who exist to glorify God and see transform lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can find us on the web at www.redbankmbc.com. Also, come visit us on Sunday at 8104 Red Bank Road in Germantown, North Carolina. Did you like this podcast? We put one out each and every week, so don't forget to subscribe. We hope this has been a blessing to you, and we thank you for listening.